Father, we thank you so much that, wow, we all can come together, Lord. It's so great to see so many of the faces that I've gotten to love and know in the last couple of years and um, see some new faces and just see what you're doing in the lives of um, these children, Lord, of, of yours, Father. So I ask that <clears throat> you give me the words to speak, Lord. I know that you changed my heart because I thought I was going to preach something else today, but you changed it just a few days ago. So obviously you have something here that somebody needs to hear or respond to, Father. So I ask that you have your way. Lord, I pray the words of John the Baptist. I must decrease and you must increase. It is in your name we pray and all God's people say, amen. amen. Awesome. So where's Pastor Mike at? Is he like in Gatlinburg or something like that? Something like that? Sweet. And you guys got married? How's that coming along? Good? Oh, he gave the thumbs up. She's just looking at me like, yeah, you wish. Thumbs up, boy. <laughs> um, today, um, we're going to talk about the hiding place. We're going we're gonna to focus on the hiding place. And we'll get into that here in just a little bit. But I, I feel... Uh, one of my strengths as a parent, which I don't have many yet, my wife is more of the, the parents, more of the, the lovey-dovey type person, and she's more of that, you know, parental, she's got all that stuff down. I don't. I'm, I'm still working on it. But I feel one of my strengths as a parent is spending one-on-one -on -one time with the kids. Uh, with Timothy, who is soon to be 10 here in a few weeks, uh, for him, we go to Barnes & Noble. We have, we call it our guys' night out. We go to Barnes & Noble, get a book or two. <laughs> While he's looking for some books, I go to the Starbucks there, take advantage of all that stuff. And, and then we go, maybe go to arcade, go grab something to eat, and then that's our guy time. You know, and I lay down next to him before bed, you know, that, that's our one-on-one -on -one time. With Hannah, on the other hand, who's six and a half, Miss Thing of the house, her, it, it's a little more complex. She is, Hannah is adorable little girl. She's got beautiful blonde hair. Blue eyes, just smiles at you some of the time. Other time, she's a terror. She's a terror. Timothy calls her a holy terror. So, because, you know, we're a biblical family. We've got to keep it holy up there. So he calls her a holy terror. So when I have one-on-one -on -one time with her, we have date night. And she loves, oh, she soaks this up. Oh, my word. Lord have mercy. She looks for those date nights. She, a few years ago, she was Southern Belle for Halloween, you know, with the nice white dress and the hat, and she's got the like little bow sheep cane, whatever that is thing. She loves that thing. So when we go out on date night, she dresses up with that. I put my suit on, and she loves it. She's like, are you going to buy me something, like a little like ring or something like that? So she gets all into it, and my car, she imagines, is a horse carriage. So I start my car. It's really the horse is like galloping, I guess, that she sees it as. And I open the back door, and she's like, thank you. You know, she's driving like that. Thank you. And so this one time we went to Olive Garden, and she, there she is. She's wearing her princess high heels, you know, kind of just stumbling with her Southern Belle dress on. And everybody in Olive Garden looking at her. She loves it. She's soaking it up. And so, you know, we had a great time. We had some Olive Garden food, you know, it was a romantic night. She was coloring with the kids' menu, and I was just eating food. And so it was a really cool time, and we came back, and we danced. There's a whole point of this, I promise. We came back, and we danced under the stars in our driveway. It was really cool. She loved it. She loved it. And she was just a princess. <clears throat> Ten hours later, the next morning, totally different story. She woke up on the wrong side of bed because somebody probably looked at her the wrong way. I don't know. She couldn't watch iCarly. I don't know what the deal is. The next morning, she got mad at somebody, and she was throwing a holy terror tantrum. So I had to put her in timeout. Well, since I put her in timeout, she didn't really like me because I was the face of the whole consequence. So she got all mad. She got all mad. Joey, ugh, you're a toilet, Joey, ugh. Man, you smell like a toilet. She couldn't say it in my face because, you know, she was just she was too scared to do that. So, uh, oh, uh, yuck. Man, uh, I'm so mad at you, Joey. And then Aubrey and I are just cracking up in the other room. <sighs> We're cracking up. We're like, oh, that's funny, a toilet. I haven't thought about that since I was like six. That is so cool. Toilet. So, so we had to pull up the reins here. I promise there's a gospel message in here somewhere. I promise. So we had, a, so like, all right, babe, we need to pull up the reins. So Aubrey put her mean mommy face on. She's like, Hannah. She said it more nicely. Um, she said, Hannah, 
By the way, are there any members of DCFS workers here, by the way? I just want to clarify this before we share the story. No. So mommy's like, Aubrey's like, Hannah, so you're mad at Joey, huh? Didn't you guys go somewhere romantic last night? And she's like, ah. Didn't you guys get all dressed up last night? Ah. Louder she spoke. Didn't you guys go dancing under the moon? Ah, and the louder, so the more and more she talked about our date night, the louder and louder she got. Because she did not know how to deal with that, with that reality. There are people today who avoid facing reality. There are people who avoid facing reality. There's a term for that. It's called escapism. Escapism is escaping from reality and creating your false sense of reality. We see this today in people who are addicted to the alcohol, those who are addicted to drugs, sex, pornography, all the addiction stuff. They try to run away from the problem just like Adam and Eve. <clears throat> After being told they could not eat of this one tree, of course the wife said, hey, let's eat of that one tree. Just kidding. Um, she, so they decided to have of that the tree in Genesis 3.8. We read that, um, that the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as, they were, as he was walking in the garden, and they hid themselves. Why do you think they hid themselves? Because they didn't want to get in trouble. They, they, they want to be faced. Oh, look at that. That is sweet. I was just talking about that. That's awesome. Okay, so, um, come on, let's focus here, guys. I've, let's focus. Oh, now where did it go? I was looking like a cool pastor. Oh, yes. Okay, so, just like Adam and Eve, they, they, didn't, wa- they didn't want to deal with their mistakes. They hid from God. So if you got your Bibles here today, you get like 10 points. That would be really sweet. Open your Bibles to, oh yes, Mr. Technology Bible Guy, to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. Hebrews 4, 13. Going New Testament here. Hebrews 4, 13. One of my favorite teachers is Dr. Charles Stanley. I love him. He is just amazing. And my only issue is with him, he talks way too fast and he gives Bible verses way too quickly and you only have time to catch up. And by the time you find the actual book and chapter, he's moved on to like 14 different things. So I don't want to be like him. I want to give you guys time to find out. I want to hear the flipping of the pages, all that stuff. So Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. I got to find it now. Okay. Nothing. Everybody say nothing. Nothing. In all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him whom we must give an account. Did you know that God sees everything? Everything. Everything. Like kids in children's church, they always say when they hear God, he's like, even when I take a shower? Yes, God sees everything. Everything is laid bare before him. There isn't anything hidden from him. There is nothing hidden from him. God sees everything. And... I like this verse in the sense of, anybody ever go driving on the interstate? Oh, come on now. You're driving on the interstate, of course, following the, all the rules and, and the speed limit, both hands on the wheel, all of that stuff. I mean, what's the speed limit these days, like 70, 80? 65 in a school zone, right? Okay, so you're driving on the interstate, listening to your Christian music, of course, pondering on the word of God that you read 45 minutes earlier. And here comes this unholy individual who needs prayer beyond measure going 90 miles an hour in front of you. He's like cutting people off, driving left and right, cuts you off, looks at you like you're the problem. And and you hope and pray that there's a cop ahead of him. Anybody ever been there? Like hope and pray that he gets caught? Well, that's never happened to me, by the way. I've never seen anybody get pulled over when they're going like that. And you're like, oh, don't you wish you'd... Hmm. Okay, so God sees that guy. God sees, the cop who gets paid to find him does not see him, but God sees everything, even that guy going 90, 95 miles an hour. He sees everything. There isn't anything hidden from him. God is omnipresent. I was on the radio earlier this week, <clears throat> and there were some people who had issues with me saying God is omnipresent. That is biblical and theologically sound. God is everywhere at the same time. There isn't anywhere he is not. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere at once. Hell is not hidden from God. Hell is, God sees everything. God is everywhere. There is nothing 
that is hidden from him. A hiding place is a place where people go where we can feel safe from impending danger, right? It's a place where we can get away from whatever troubles us, a place where no one knows just where we are or what we're feeling or what we're thinking. See, I watch kids these days like our kids. Oh, bless their souls. They have, I don't know what, they play hide and go seek. Anybody ever go play hide and go seek? I don't know, is that a game people play these days with video games and computers and Facebook? I don't know. But the kids, they play hide and go seek. And some of the places they try to find, just not good hiding spots, seriously. Hiding under a blanket in the middle of the floor, seriously. Is that what the public school system are teaching our kids today? Really? I see you! Ha! Ah! Or, or I love the part where they try to hide in the curtain, you know, like uh, you know, hiding curtain by the window, and, but you see they're like dirty feet and it's all like, really? Come on, you gotta hide like, you know, what's that in the, the, the bottom of the house? What is that called? Come on. The crawl space. How I many you gotta dig under there? Some healthy, I'm just kidding. Okay, don't do that. Okay, but we established that there's nowhere you can go to hide from God. Nowhere you can go. But let's just pretend. Let's pretend. Let's throw on uh, our Mr. Rogers sweaters and let's go to the neighborhood of make-believe. I love Mr. Rogers. Mm, that trolley was so cool. I can never understand that trolley, but Mr. Rogers cool, did, and that made him cool. So let's go to the neighborhood of make-believe and let's pretend. Let's pretend that there was a place you can hide from God. Let's just pretend. Let's just pretend. Don't get all yelling at me or anything. Let's just pretend that there, was, there is a physical place where you can hide from God. And the question is, who would go there and why? Who would go and hide from God? Like a convict who, who robs a bank, runs away from the police because he don't want to get caught. It's maybe people who don't want to get caught want to go there, don't want to deal with consequences, or they, don't want to, they want to continue that lifestyle, like a person who chooses to live a life without Christ and, and ever accepting the blood of Christ into their life. They, they don't want to fully commit themselves to the personhood of Jesus Christ. They feel that conviction in church, but they run away from God by refusing to go to church ever again. But praise God that God does not live and dwell in the pews of a building. He lives and dwells in each and every believer. So brothers and sisters, we need to go out and share that hope of Christ to those who are running away from him and do it in love. Oh man, I spoke, I spoke on that one. We need to do it in love. Did you know a lot of people can quote John 3.16? Most of us <clears throat> can quote John 3.16, but can you quote John 3.17? I think that is an important verse, obviously. John 3.17 says, For God did not send his son into the world to, uh, to condemn it, but to save the world through him. See, Jesus didn't come here to beat on you. He didn't come here to condemn you. He didn't come here to make fun of you. He didn't come here to condemn you, but to save you. See, Jesus didn't come here to condemn, and neither should we. You know, uh, what a lot of people say, like the unchurched, the unchristians, they, they say about us Christians is that we tend to judge. <clears throat> and I think sometimes I've seen where a pastor, you know, would uh, respectfully and assertively go to somebody and say, hey, you know what, that's kind of wrong, you shouldn't be doing that. And the person responds, oh, you're just judging me. See, they fall back on that. You know, so, you know, that kind of voids that all, all out. But I think we as Christians, we tend to judge. It's maybe a little too much. Kind of mentally put labels on people like, oh, you're, you're the lowest of the low. I'm not going to deal with you. We tend to judge. And we see a perfect example of this thanks to our good friends at Westboro Baptist Church in Kansas, picketing the funerals of, of soldiers and telling them God, that God hates gay people and God hates this, God hates that. Uh, Ephesians 4.15 tells us that we need to speak the truth in love. Some of us like to speak the truth, but forget the love part out. You know, God devoted an entire chapter in 1 Corinthians 13 about love. We forget that. So we need to preach the truth in love and share the hope of these people who are trying to hide from God, trying to hide from him. So when you catch a fish, come on now, you, you want anybody go fishing, by the way? Anybody like fishing? Nobody? Man, three people. We went to um, just random thought. I mean, come on. Yeah, I got time. We're good. So just a random thought. I went fishing uh, a few weeks ago. We went to uh, this, this place, this lodge area, and you can rent fishing poles. So I've been catching, trying to catch this big fish the entire weekend. The entire weekend, I'm catching these little, like, whatever, this little whatever. So the last day we were there on vacation, and these are fishing pools that you rent, okay? 
Um, I was not, wasn't even planning on talking about this, but I'm so glad you guys asked how, I, how much I love fishing. So I got this fishing pole, and I see this big fish, right? And, you know, the water was clear, so I'm like, oh, yes. Okay, so I got the thing. I put the, the bait on, and I dropped it right in front of him. Okay, I'm like praying, okay, come on, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. And he bit it. I'm like, yes! And then I pulled back the reel, snaps in half, everything just that. It was a rented piece of crap of a fishing pole. It was terrible. I can't wait to go back next year so I can get that fish. Okay, where were we? Oh, yes. Okay, we need to speak the truth in love. See, when we go fishing, we don't put our favorite food on the fishing line so the fish can catch it. No, we put what the fish likes so it can grab onto it. See, we need to attract the person to Christ by using love. We need, we need to love them because if you don't, that's going to turn them off. And the Bible says that love never fails. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. So, back to the whole point. So, if there was a hiding place from God, I think, you know, we would have people who would hide out from God, people who don't want to be held accountable, but I think a big big part of the population in this fictional place where people would hide out from God would be those who are filled with shame. People who are filled with shame from past mistakes. They don't, they, past sins that kind of get in the way of how you're living life. Past sins that just, just hold you down and shackle you down. Maybe it's past a, an abortion that you may have had or, or infidel in your marriage you had a few years ago or an addiction that you have secretly or carrying that big life-changing lie and, and, and you're hiding out from it. You're trying to cover it in all these skeletons that you have. See, if God is omnipresent, and, and which means he's everywhere, so that means if you're running away from God, you're really running to him can't get away from them. can't get away. People with past mistakes allow those mistakes to hold them in bondage today. Those are the people that may hide in this fictional hiding place from God. Just like our buddy Peter in the Bible. Oh, I love Peter. Peter is so cool. He was a fisherman. He knows how to catch those fish. I don't. Peter, Peter is so cool. I mean, this man walked on water for like three and a half seconds, but he still walked on water. He was sitting down having uh, supper with Jesus. And they were having the last dinner, you know, and Jesus doing his Jesus stuff, so cool, you know. Sitting down, and Jesus said something to the effect of, hey, you know, when I get arrested, when, the, when, when they come and get me, you guys are going to scatter. Jesus was quoting scripture to them. And, and, and Peter jumped up and said, uh-uh, nope, not me, Jesus. Though all these people, they're going to be all sissies. They're all going to run away. You can count on me. I'm Mr. Don Juan, Jesus. I, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to run away. I will go to prison for you. I'm going to go die for you. Though all of these fools are going to run away, I'm going to stay behind you. I'm your main man, Jesus. Anybody have seen one of those barking dogs, those small little dogs that just, little poodles and all that? My grandma used to... Um, used to clean houses, and um, she cleaned this house for this one rich woman who, like, her house was like a museum, you know, no flash photography, and, you know, no sitting at the table, you know, all that, you know, what, you know what I'm talking about? And, like, so she, they, like, she, like, so much pledge on the floor, like, you can, like, slip, you know, she's, like, one of them, like, don't sit at the table, don't use those towels, like, which don't make some sense, we got them over there. Okay, so she had this poodle, this small little barking dog, I remember the name of this thing, I don't know, but... This dog barks a lot. I mean, the small little poodle. I mean, in the back of your mind, you know, boy, I can just fling you like that. You fly across the room like that. That was Peter. Peter was like, rawr, 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 Jesus, I'm not going to deny you. I'm not going to deny you. I'm like, and to, the word, to where Jesus said, hey, you're going to deny me three times, son, so I'm going to be praying for you. Peter had superior commitment in his statement. It's like, though, all of them, Jesus, they're going to run away. I'm going to be your barking poodle, Jesus. <clears throat> so, there's Jesus after dinner praying in the garden. And guess what happens? He gets arrested and people run away. Jesus wasn't lying. He wasn't lying. Jesus kept his word. Imagine that. See, I kind of thought about this. And a lot of people think, okay, let me just scratch that. 
Let me ask you guys a question. What if, let's just pretend, Mr. Rogers again, neighborhood make-believe, little trolley. What if Jesus meant everything he said? Think about that. What if Jesus meant everything he said? But Pastor Joey, he did. Then why are we living like he didn't? After they ran away, Peter is spotted. He's all chicken. Oh, no, he got arrested. That's terrible. And then somebody said, hey, you're that Galilean, aren't you? No. No. A couple minutes later, hey, you're that Peter guy. He was, he was with that, that, that Jesus guy. No. Uh-uh. I don't know what you're talking about. Then again, by the, by the campfire, hey, you're that Galilean that was, that was with Jesus. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. In Matthew, it says that he started cussing and swearing. Peter. I don't, blah, 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 beep, 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 beep. Jerry Springer, beeps and tones and all that. I don't know what you're talking about. And all of a sudden, cock a doo doo doo. See, in children's church right now, they'd be laughing. They're like, yo, Pastor Joey said doo doo. That is so cool. So he heard the, the cock crow. And all of a sudden, the eyes of Peter and Jesus met. Hmm. And he remembered what Jesus had told them. I mean, their eyeballs were locked. You know, your, your mom ever gave you that mother look? Just look like that? And you're like, oh, dang. Oh, okay, let's go. But th this was deeper. Peter realized his failure and what Jesus had told him before. He looked at Jesus and he heard the rooster crow. And he realized, I made a mistake. And he left out crying, not just crying, but crying bitterly. See, I think there are different forms of crying. I think there's the boo-hoo, boy, that was a great Hallmark movie type of crying. Let's go out and have some lunch now type of crying. There's also the, oh, dang, I lost my job. I need some chocolate type of crying where there's some hope to those tears. Like, okay, I'll just go to Social Security. I mean, Obama's president, so we get a whole bunch of money. Anyway, okay, sorry. And there's also, I think there's the uncontrollably boogers coming out. I cannot control myself type of crying. And I think that's what Peter did. He wept bitterly because Peter did something he thought he would never do, ever. He, he was just testifying to Jesus, how I, I'm your main man. I will never do that. And he thought he would never do it, and he did. Anybody like that here today? Man, anybody like that here today? I would never do this one thing, and sure enough, he fell into it. You know, I work with, um, I'm wrapping up my, my job with um, Chestnut Health Systems in Bloomington. It's a treatment, rehab, residential treatment for adolescents. And most of these teenagers are the ones you kind of see on TV with a life of crime, you know, messed up parents, messed up family, dysfunctional. And they come in with just a whole bunch of just stuff, man, and just heart breaks for them. And... And it's so funny because they go in and out of treatment. They spend six months in treatment. Two months later, they're back. And they do this five or six times. That's terrible. And during that time, they go to deeper drugs than just the, the small drugs. They get into heroin using needles and all that. And they thought they would never have done that. That is so sad and so depressing when you look at their story. They thought they would never turn to needles so they can get that high. They thought it was only their, their marijuana, their weed, or whatever you want to call it would get them high, but now they can't believe that they've gone that low hick rock bottom. And Peter couldn't believe that he denied Jesus Christ. I mean, after all the, 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 the years, three years spending time with, with Jesus and, and seeing 5,000 men get, get fed and, and walking on water and, sees, and see Jesus calming the storm, and he can't believe, I cannot believe, I denied Jesus Christ not once, not twice, but three times publicly. That's apostasy. Apostasy is publicly denying the faith. There's Pastor, Pastor Yosef. Out there, I forgot which country he's in right now, he is a prisoner because he will not deny the Christian faith in this, I think, Muslim country. And they have him on trial right now. They're, they're, they might kill him because of apostasy, publicly denying the Muslim faith. See, that, that, that's what Peter was at that time. He publicly denied Jesus Christ three times. So messed up was Peter that he told everybody, 
I'm going back fishing. Now, Peter hasn't gone fishing in like three years. Remember, when Jesus called him to be in his ministry, Jesus told him, hey, you drop your nets, and I want you to come follow me. So Peter hadn't gone fishing in like three years. So in other words, Peter was saying, you know what, this ministry stuff is too much for me. I ain't going to deal with it. I'm going back to my old job. I'm going back to my old ways. And I bet, putting yourself in Peter's shoes... Remember, he wept bitterly. That's biblical. You can read that in all accounts in the Gospels. He wept. He cried like a baby. And I, I bet, oh man, I bet you, that he felt a million times worse after Jesus died. I didn't even have a chance to say I was sorry. Hmm. Didn't even have a chance to say I'm sorry. I didn't mean it, Jesus. And, after, and I bet you, oh man, that he felt a million times worse after Jesus died. In Mark chapter 16, if you can turn to there, please. 16.4. Peter had his head hung low. I'm messed up. I'm, I'm, I'm done with this ministry stuff. I'm ready to go hiding. I, I, I'm tired. I'm, this is not good. I messed it up. I, there's no way that I can be redeemed. There's no way that, that I could... I could ever go back to doing what I was doing. Uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 4. Mary and the other Mary, this was after Jesus had died. They were going to go to anoint Jesus' body. They were going to go to the tomb. And they wanted to see what was up, and they noticed something. Uh, Verse 4, are we all there, by the way? Okay, good. Verse 4 says, But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? Verse 7, but go, tell his disciples and Peter that he, is, that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Did you guys catch that? Verse 7. It says, but go, tell his disciples and Peter. But go, tell his disciples and Peter. Everybody say, and Peter. And Peter. The angel specifically called out Peter. By this time, Peter was, uh, at, was probably no longer considering himself a disciple. I can't even believe I did that. Peter's head was hung down low. But the angel, which is a messenger from God, God, the, the, Peter, this is what I'm saying to you. I know you messed up, but I still want you, Peter. Oh, Peter, you messed it up big time, but I still love you, Peter. Peter, don't you dare give up on me. Don't you dare hang your head hung low on me, Peter. I still need you. I still want you. I still got plans for you, Peter. Don't you dare give up on me, Peter. Don't you dare. Don't you dare lower your face on me, Peter. I still want you. You messed up, but I still love you. Peter's face was hung low because of his mistake. But the Bible says in Psalm 33 that he will be the lifter of our heads, that God will be the lifter of our heads. Which I don't think personally that God will actually take his hand and lift up our heads. I think he is going to say something. I think he's going to do something that is going to overwhelm you with his love overwhelm you with his grace, overwhelm you with his mercy, where you're going to be like, hallelujah, these shackles are gone. God loves me despite my skeletons. Two words, and Peter, two words, and Peter, two words, and Peter, change the course of this man's life. Two words. Go tell the disciples, and Peter. Don't let your past mistakes paralyze you from what God wants for you. Peter was broken. I mean, he was broken. A broken man. But praise God, when we break into a million little pieces, I mean, a million little pieces, like dust, he can pick each 
and every piece up, no matter how many pieces there are, put you back together again and restore you to where you were, or even better. See, God did not restore Peter. He did not restore Peter. He restored him to a better Peter because this same Peter, who didn't have any boldness whatsoever, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't talk about knowing Jesus, was the same Peter who testified and preached on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 men got saved. This was the same Peter who was at the temple gate and, and healed this paralyzed man, was flogged and beaten by the, the Pharisees. And after being beaten and flogged, came out to that same temple court where it all started from. See, God took a man that was nothing and made him into something. God can make something out of nothing. That is so cool. He made this world. He didn't have Plato. He made this world out of nothing. He hung this world on nothing. Hung it on nothing. That's biblical. It's somewhere in the Old Testament how he hung this world on nothing. And, and all God had to do was speak it, and it was being. And it was it. It was there, and it came to be. He spoke this entire world into existence, and God sent an angel that day to say just two words to Peter, for Peter, and changed his life. Two words, and Peter. But Pastor Joey, you don't understand what I've done. Pastor Joey, you, you don't understand the shame that I'm going through. You don't understand the, the skeletons in my closet. You don't understand. No, I don't. I don't understand. I'm going to be lying to you if I knew or understand. I don't. But I know what it means to be loved. I know what it means to be unshackled and taking the chains off. I know what it means to live in victory despite my skeletons, despite my selfish heart, despite my own mistakes. I know what, I, I don't understand what you're going through personally on that side of the fence. I've been on that side of the fence. That's why I'm on this side of the fence because I know the one who can transfer you over to this side. God loved me despite my own mistakes. John 3, 16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It doesn't say, God, because you jacked up, somebody had to die. It said, but God so loved you. That's why he gave his son. Remember growing up, the stupid stuff we used to do? Oh, man. If you caught your kids doing what you used to do back then, whoo! Thank God there's no DCFS workers today in this building. I used to, being young, it was all innocent. Like I used to take like snow. There's no kids here. Okay, good. I used to take snow and just being dumb, I used to put all this snow in the mailbox. So when the snow melted, it would melt all over the mail. Like, oh. But this one time, my cousin, she was a crossing guard in like the eighth grade. So um, crossing guard first school. So she had like the belt thing, you know, like orange belt. Like, hey, stop. Huh? Come on. So one day I took it from her, being fifth grade, I don't know. And I grew up in Chicago, <clears throat> where there's a lot of traffic. I took this crossing guard belt in, on, uh, what street was that? That was uh, Addison Avenue. You don't know where that's at, but it's really busy. Addison Avenue, being in fifth grade, one morning, I just want to have fun. So I put this belt on. Ain't nobody coming by, but I stopped the traffic, and they stopped, and I got all excited, and I moved, and I went back home. I, I would, I, whew, my kids did that. Whew. I'm going somewhere with that. I forgot what again. <laughs> Hang on, wait a second, wait. Come on, it's all good. Um, I'm going somewhere with that. I just totally forgot. All right, anyways, turn to your Bibles for, uh, to Luke 15. Yes, oh, yes, 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 thank you. So we all had those rebellious stages. We are going to read about in Luke chapter 15, a young man who wanted to put his own crossing guard uniform on and do his own thing. Luke chapter 15. <clears throat> he left his home. You guys know the story as the prodigal son. Left his home looking for freedom. So, Dad, I, I, want, I, I want my part of the estate. We all know the story. Dad said, okay, here you go. Left home. Lived it all up, spent it all. And found himself without no money. We all know the story. A great famine came over the land. 
and he found himself feeding pigs, hanging out in the pig pen. No money. Far away from home. The Bible said it was a far country. He left home seeking freedom, but turned out to be a slave. Started working for uh, a pig farmer. He was eating what the pigs ate. I mean, this kid hit rock bottom. Spent all the money. Feeling lonely. Terrible. Verse 17. Are we there, by the way? I, did I say Luke 15, 17? Hang on. Yes, okay. Luke 15, 17. It says, when he came to his senses... So by this time, this kid's in the pig pen, like literally hanging out in the mud. When he came to his senses, oh, this is a great scripture. When he came to his senses, sometimes we need to hit rock bottom for God to get to us. That's not fun. I think there's something called natural consequences that our kids need to experience. We cannot go and save them each and every time they're feeling sad or bad about something, especially if God's trying to convict them and we're there trying to make them feel better. It's like you and God going face off. God's like, no, I want this natural consequence to happen so your son or your daughter can learn a little something, something. So verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, hmm, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare and here I am starving to death? I will, verse 18, I will set out and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Boy, this kid's feeling bad by this time, man. He's feeling bad. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up, went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. Uh, don't you kind of think that his dad was kind of looking for him? If he saw him from a long way off. <laughs> He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put, on, and put it on him. Bring a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. So they begin to celebrate. How many of you have read this like a million and a half times, right? You know this, yeah? See, I think there's a difference between reading your Bible and studying your Bible. Because, <clears throat> check this out, if you read it, you're going to miss it. Verse 18, remember he's in the pig pen. He's eating mud, he's eating what the, the pigs eat. I, this is what he said, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Okay, watch this now. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. Okay, great. This is what he said. But in verse 21, this is, he says the same exact thing, or does he? Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer to be worthy to be called your son, dot, dot, dot. But the father interrupted him. His father wouldn't even let him finish his sentence. Remember, he was going to say, uh, hire me as one of your hired servants. His father won't even let him finish his sentence. God's not going to make you a slave. He's not looking for another slave. He wants you to be his son. He wants you to be his daughter. He's, if you're lost today, if you're hiding out from God, come on home. He's not going to do what we do. He's not going to stomp on you, criticize you, put you down. You just come on home. Come on out. No need to hide because there's no real place where you can hide from God because he wants you back into the family. He will receive you like royalty. He will receive you like royalty. He won't do what we do. Boy, I told you so. I told you so. I told you so. If you would have listened to me, he's going to grab you, whoo, hug you and say, welcome home, baby boy. Welcome home, baby girl. Because that's the love of a father. Love won't even let you talk about less than what you really are. It won't even let you talk about less, about being less than a child of God. Friend, living in a hiding place would be too depressing. It would be too depressing. Hiding from God would be too depressing. Talk about being at your lowest low, not having any hope. Hiding in this hiding place would be too depressing. That's why this place doesn't exist. Hebrews 4, to Hebrews 4.13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and, and laid bare before the eyes of him to 
whom we must give an account. If you're hiding out from God today, come on home. He's waiting for you. There's, I don't care what's, he don't care. This has nothing to do with me. He don't care about what skeletons. Yeah, you guys will have to talk about that, but he's more focused on you coming home instead of the shackles that you put on you each and every day. See, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's biblical. Where the, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. We try to go out today, and, and we have these shackles on us, this, this depressing mindset, and we go try to look for a key in other people. We try to look for that key to unlock the, the shackles that we have through sex, through porn, through alcohol, through booze, through drugs, and, and through uh, emotional stimuli or whatever. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. I got the one key that I am never going to lose, and I want to unshackle shackle you you just got to come on home so this is going to be your opportunity i i don't i don't mean to cause too much ripples in the water today but if if you are tired of living a life apart from god that gets depressing and tiring you're going to have the opportunity to come forward and there's nothing specific about coming forward to this like carpet because this carpet is going to die out in, in 50 years or whenever it's just making that public commitment god i'm ready i am ready god i am tired of living this lifestyle and you're going to have this opportunity after i pray while margie is going to sing and play a song so i'm going to pray and if you feel that tug Oh, you know that's God. But also, on the flip side of that tug, you're going to feel like, oh, uh uh People are going to look at me because, you know, I'm a, I'm, maybe I'm a leader in this church or, or I'm, this pride might get in the way. People might think negatively of me or, or this, is, this is, I don't want to let this go. I don't want to let this go. That, that's the enemy. But if you feel this tug, do not deny it. Do not deny it because he will not deny you. Father, we thank you so much that there is no such place that we could hide from you, Lord. You are everywhere, Lord. We can't even run away from you. You know exactly what we're thinking. You know exactly the hair uh, number of hairs on our head, Lord. You know exactly what we're thinking before we even ask you. We can't get away from you, Lord. But Father, I pray if there's somebody in this room today that needs to get right with you, Lord. I pray they come forward and put all the pride and all the the awkward feelings aside and say, I want Jesus. You can have this world. I don't want it. I want Jesus. Lord, I pray that this will come to be true today of somebody in this room. Father, we thank you so much in Jesus' name and all God's people say, amen.